Welcome to Very Honored Frater BT's Esoterra Nerd Podcast, episode 37, in which we interview Very Honored Frater A.K.H.V. That sound means time travel. Hi, this is BT speaking from the future. Actually, from your point of view listening to this, I'm speaking from the past. However, from the point of view of the recording of this episode, I'm speaking from three and a half years in the future. It is currently May 23rd, 2019, and I've been living in New Delhi, India for the past year, whereas this episode was originally released on December 28th, 2015. About a year ago, my former proctor featured in this episode contacted me because his uh, career has kind of gotten to a place where he's being considered for certain high positions which require election. And as you might imagine, not everybody in the particular, shall we say, exoteric Christian organization uh, that he's a part of would be understanding of his having anything to do with, uh, you know, this podcast or its content. So he, uh, he asked me to take the episode down. But recently, I was getting back into a little bit of Alan Watts, and I was remembering that we had spoken about Alan Watts and his uh, once having been a rector in the Episcopal Church himself. And it occurred to me to uh, write to my old friend and uh, mentor and ask him if he would be okay with me re-releasing a modified version of our interview uh, in which I take out his real name as well as the specifics of the parish in which he was serving at the time. So, enough of me rambling from the future past. Uh, Let's get back to the original episode. But first... Tech support. If you'd like to read along at home, just go to Google, type in T-E-C-H-D-I-C-T dot P-D-F. It's the first link. Actually, the Tech Dictionary is no longer available at that site. But there is still a way, if you would like to have the entire Tech Dictionary, the book they don't want you to have, in PDF format, you can do so through the particular web page connected to this podcast episode, which with most podcast software you can easily reach uh, you know, from your app. There's probably a, a place you can click to get to that website. And then... Uh, just click where it says the words tech support on the description, and that will take you to a page which features the segments. And then there's a, a paragraph explaining each of the segments that we have here on the Esoteric Nerd Podcast, and uh, the link for the tech support segment will take you directly to that uh, PDF file. Today's episode is brought to you by the letter G. G for game. One, any state of beingness wherein exist awareness, problems, havingness, and freedom, or separateness, each in some degree. Two, a contest of person against person or team against team. Three. All games are continuing by definition, since an unstarted game isn't a game, and a finished game isn't a game. Four. A game consists of freedoms, barriers, and purposes. Today's episode is also brought to you by the letter F. F for facsimile. 1. Any mental picture that is unknowingly created and part of the time track is a facsimile. 
whether an engram, secondary, lock, or pleasure moment. 2. A theta recording. All physical perceptions, all effort, emotion, and thought which a person experiences are recorded continuously, and these recordings are called facsimiles. They are not dependent upon an organism for their continued existence. Any facsimile which has been recorded is there to be recalled. When the individual has risen high enough on the tone scale, when he has regained enough of his self-determinism. 3. An energy picture made by a thetan, or the body's machinery, of the physical universe environment. It is like a photograph. It is made of mental energy. It means copy of the physical universe. 4. The pictures contained in the reactive mind. 5. A full facsimile is a sort of three-dimensional color picture with sound and smell and all other perceptions plus the conclusions or speculations of the individual. 6. A simple word meaning a picture of a thing, a copy of a thing not the thing itself. 7. A facsimile is an energy picture which can be reviewed again. A facsimile contains more than 50 easily identified perceptions. It also contains emotion and thought. For more about that, check out the beginning of episode 27 with Sora Clayito where I list the 55 perceptics. 8. Means the physical universe impression on thought, and it means that section of thought which has a physical universe impression on it, and it has a time tag on it. A happy winter solstice to everyone, a happy Yule, happy Hanukkah, and of course Merry Christmas. Our guest tonight is a rector at St. here for the Esoteric Nerd Podcast first of what hopefully will be many Christmas episodes. Let's get to that interview, shall we? Thanks, Fratter. Welcome to the Esoterra Nerd Podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what is it that you are preparing for in a half an hour? Um, I have uh, 5 p.m. Mass uh, at uh, our Episcopal Church here in and uh, I am the pastor. So I, uh, they call us rector mm-hmm. at the uh, Episcopal Church. And this is uh, this is my location. We have two services on a Sunday, a ten o'clock and a five p.m. And that is our weekday Eucharist. Excellent. Well, let's see how many things we can cover in a half an hour. Excellent. Now, Excellent. Thank the, you. Back in the uh, in the early to mid '90s, I remember, without going into too much detail, I remember you were a, a, a theatrical performer with, <laughs> with with an interest in esoterica. Yes, yes. I remember uh, leading lots of different meditation groups at my house. We were uh, hoping to pierce through the veil of the mysteries. I think at that time the uh, Kabbalah was all the rage, mm. and that's the, uh, the the whole mystical side of Judaism. And it was both uh, in, in all of its multivarious forms in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so. We, we hoped to be like the early prophets and rise through the spheres. That was our, that was sort of the stock and trade in those days. Now, you mentioned piercing the veil. Would that have anything to do with the veil of Paroket? Of course it would. Of course it would. <laughs> that, that dovetails nicely into, we had an earlier discussion that didn't get recorded, uh, where we talked a lot about the evolution of the tabernacle in the wilderness into our modern day uh, churches. Yes, yeah, 
um, I, I'd like to think that the, uh, the, the churches bear the, uh, the best of the tabernacle in the wilderness, but I'm afraid that the Christian churches have uh, never been the same since we got into bed with Caesar in the early 300s and started owning property. Right. Um, but, uh, but by and large, yeah, we, the churches are supposed to be the one places where the Holy Spirit uh, the, or the Shekinah, the Holy, actually descends. Um, uh, you know, it, it's funny that there's so many layers of, uh, of meaning in both of the, the places and the, the, the hope that they've come from, plus the government overlay of, of hundreds and now thousands of years. Um, but, yeah, we, we are uh, still I still hold out hope. Uh, you know, when I was when I was ordained, I was told to be careful not to confuse the institution of the church with the living presence of the Christ himself. Uh, right. But but we still hold out hope that this is one of the few places where, where holiness can occur, if nowhere else in society. Right. What were you uh, What were you thinking? Of? Remind me what we talked about about the tabernacle. Well, let's see. Uh, uh, there was there was the one school that I believe we're both familiar with the uh, the tradition of the Golden Dawn established in Victorian England. In the, oh yeah. In the second grade or the grade of Zelator, uh, we get a certain representation of the tabernacle symbolism or the uh, the, the various symbols of the Temple of Solomon, for instance in initiatory style and re- with, yeah. with the occult symbolism expounded upon and all of that sort of thing. One of the, one thing we talked about was that everything used to be oriented toward the West. Oh yes, yes, yes. And so that the door, the doors of the original temple could, could, uh, could greet the rising sun. Um, mm. But now, now we, we've turned, uh, all of our, our churches are meant to face, face in the direction of the resurrection, which we assume is coming from the east, the same place of, of the rising sun. Right. So with that, that, that esoteric turn, uh, it, it's really interesting. Our, our priests like me, we used to face the direction of the east, leading, uh, sort of leading the congregation in that direction like a, like a ship. So we've gone from the image of the, of, of the, with the church as tabernacle or tent into image of building and then into image of ship. Uh, which is why the center of the church is called the nave, because uh, it's meant to, it, if you look up at a tall, tall building, oftentimes the, the pitch of the roof can look like the inside of the upside down of a ship. So it's called the nave, uh, short for, for uh, like Naval Academy or, or the Navy. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea is the priest was leading the ship towards the east, towards the rising of the sun. And uh, only in the last generation or so have we really sort of moved away from from that since uh, the Roman church decided that uh, they would put the priest behind the altar and facing the congregation. So we've sort of Mm -hmm. lost that image of leading the congregation East. And in some ways the priest takes on uh, much more of a teaching role uh, or even, even in some ways a serving role uh, behind the altar. Although I had one, uh, one old parishioner who really loved, the fact that everybody faced east and, and misses the fact now that, that even in the Episcopal churches, the priest stands behind the altar facing the congregation. He says, we've gone from father leading us to father bartender uh, serving us. <laughs> Interesting. I uh, used to attend the um, Norbertine mass down at St. Michael's Abbey, which I guess uh, wow. Norbert was a guy in the 1200s who thought – that he didn't approve of all the changes that had been made in the Latin mass in the past 600 <laughs> years. So he, he went back to the old script. And so, oh, yeah. so these guys make the Tridentine look like, you know, revisionists. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, and I, I, I really enjoyed the ceremony and, you know, I could really groove with uh, some of the tonalities, but then in the homily, without fail, the priest would, would stand up and, and offend the hell out of me. You know, he, he, mm. he, he, there was one time a, a few years back, obviously, where he was comparing uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to Hitler, talking about stem cell research and, you know, vote no on this, vote yes on this, blocking gay marriage and so on. And so it was very refreshing. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my friend Silence the Aquarian invited me over to the uh, All Saints Church in Pasadena with, uh, what, what was his name? Oh, no. Ed, is, was it Ed Bacon? Father Ed Bacon, Ed Bacon, yes. Yeah, and he, similarly, their politics was discussed, but it was in a very different light, and he he actually was very passionate about what he was saying, and I 
was surprised when he had, there was one point where he was saying that the that the people that are you know that really need to to do the most soul searching are the people like him the straight white men who are in positions of power and yep. here he is yep. standing oh, at the yeah. front of the church and <laughs> it's like <laughs> kind of a huh what okay you know and uh but he was talking about you know more acceptance more of this and and uh you know my friend's wife was breastfeeding there you know, in the middle of service, and a few people looked over and nodded approvingly. And I was like, well, I, I, I like this. You know, I, yeah. I mean, it's still a little weird. I mean, I, it strikes me as just, a, a, in general, the, the idea of having everybody in a room in agreement based on what one person is saying, still just that alone strikes me <laughs> as a little odd. But if I had to choose between the, the, the Norbertines and the uh, Episcopals here in Pasadena, then uh, surely the, my people are over at the Episcopal Church. <laughs> well, my uh, I- interestingly, uh, All Saints Pasadena plays an important part in my own formation. Uh, I, I don't, this is a piece of my story I don't think you know. Hmm. Um, when I was living in L.A. and our first child was born and we were, uh, we were attending a Catholic church in Burbank. Mm-hmm. At, that point, at that point, it was run by the Holy Cross priests uh, in, in order of Roman Catholic uh, brothers. And uh, one priest I know I visit on a regular basis and we would sit and talk and my, my, my one and a half two-year-old would sort of toddle around the room well we didn't call it spiritual direction but i i wasn't Episcopal at the time and i wasn't catholic uh, i was actually quaker and kind of looking for uh, for for what the next path i was supposed to follow and this lovely priest uh, father ron father ron and i were sitting in his office while my daughter toddled around the room and he said well what would you consider to be your perfect you know profession how would you describe what you really want to do and i said well i'd like to teach people and i'd like to just to, to speak publicly and, and lead people to a spiritual experience that, that teaches them where god is at in their lives and and he said it sounds like you ought to be a priest <laughs> yeah. and on the word on the word priest the halogen light that was had been between us the entire time in his office blew out wow and I, we both sort of <gasps> held our breath and looked at the lamp and i i said well i'd rather have a light bulb go on than off but i'll take whatever symbol i can get <laughs> it was it was later though uh, because no one said anything good about the episcopalians to me. as a matter of fact i considered most episcopalians pretty milk toast mm. and pretty white and uh, as someone had tried to point out the Episcopal Church to me years earlier, and I said, please, just name one Episcopal saint. You know, I, I couldn't think of one person who was sort of you know, will, willing to, to, to lead the charge. I've since learned about many, but uh, it was as I was leaving Los Angeles that the same Father Ron, where the light bulb had gone off, Father Ron called me up on the phone and said, you, I've just come back from All Saints Pasadena. Oh, if we could do liturgy like that that if if we could and he had experienced kind of what you did about the the open-heartedness yeah uh the, 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 as as well as a sense of what it means to be a worshiping community and i said ron no one's ever said anything good about the episcopalians he said oh you really got you've got to check this out <laughs> so i uh i actually have never stepped foot in all saints pasadena oh yeah I have, uh, but because of that one comment and his one experience on one Sunday there, as soon as I moved back to Florida, I started exploring every Episcopal church that I possibly could. Nice. And I thought, okay, I, I can I can sit through some sleepy uh, white people liturgy and figure out, you know. I, I finally met some some of the most wonderful people, though. I said, uh, I said, well, is this possible in the Episcopal Church? And they would say, yes, but you won't see it very often. I said, but is exciting worship and people actually having a sense that God is present in their lives in the midst of where, yes, but you won't always experience that. And then I started describing some of the other dynamic pieces that that, that were meaningful, as well as the mystical uh, the, the mystical side of Christianity. And they said, yes, it's all here. Uh, you just have to kind of dig for it. And, right. Uh, and then, so that's kind of what I've been doing now for almost almost ten years as an Episcopal priest. Nice. Well, and you're in uh, uh, good company. Alan Watts wasn't he once an Episcopal priest? Yep, 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 yep. And uh, oh, 
blocking on whoever else. There, there's been a handful, of course. Uh, most uh, it used to be, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, in order to be a prominent Episcopal priest, you'd also have to either be a Freemason uh, or join some of the other uh, sort of mainline mainline clubs right. uh, and, and societies. But uh, free, there's a long history, long Anglican history between Freemasons and, uh, and, and Episcopalians as well, Anglicans, of course. Was it basically on the day, was it the 4th of July, 1776, that they changed the name Anglican to Episcopal, or did it happen the day after? Oh, or? well. Right around yeah, that, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, 1789, oh, actually. Oh, okay. There was, there was a huge debate as to what we should call ourselves because in the churches in this country, they were – we couldn't call ourselves Anglican because we had just gotten rid of England right. and, the, and the king and, and all of that. As a matter of fact, we couldn't have bishops right away because uh, – but there was also a question whether the church would continue with or without bishops uh, because in order to become ordained a bishop – You'd have to go to the old country, go to England, and swear allegiance to the crown. Red tape. We obviously want. Yeah, yeah, couldn't do <laughs> the original do. red yeah. tape. <laughs> the, yes, yes. Um, and and the other thing that we, we we prided ourselves on and sort of still do is is the uh, apostolic succession, saying that our our line of bishops go all the way back to in England, Augustine of Canterbury, mm. and uh, before Augustine of Canterbury in 597, uh, all the way back to through the, the popes in Rome to Peter uh, and the other the other apostles that Jesus, we uh, presume, laid hands on. Right. Um, I like to call apostolic succession the holy game of tag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're it. Yeah, yeah. And if you can prove that you've been playing that game of tag for a long time, then you get to be one of the apostolic churches. Um, I think we've got we've got that. It's 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 rife in every, every lineage. Society. Yeah, yeah, lineage. All it's all about lineage. <laughs> Oi. So um, the Episcopal Church was not called just the Episcopal Church at first. The, the, the word Episcopal means bishop. It comes from the, the Greek word for episkopos or uh, 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 overseer. It's, it's the New Testament word for superintendent, uh, the person who sort of uh, oversees epi over uh, scopus or sees uh, a community. Mm. And, uh, and so it represents the line of episcopoi or uh, the line of bishops going down through a generation. And if, originally, we don't think it was necessarily the game of tag, although it might have been a laying on of hands. It was certainly, could you show that your community uh, of Christians had consistent leadership that was sort of con continuing to teach what the apostles taught? All that aside, right. the Episcopal Church in this country wanted to be called Episcopal, but the only other thing that was called Episcopal in those days was the uh, Maryland Church. Uh, and the Church of Maryland, the Episcopal Church of Maryland, were the Roman Catholics in this country. Hmm. So originally in 1789, this church was called the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America – which would be a little like saying, we are the Protestant Catholics. <laughs> we are the Reformed Catholics. <laughs> huh. you know, or we are the Diet Catholics, right. the Catholic light. Um, <laughs> trying to say, we, we, we've got bishops, but uh, you know, we don't always take them so seriously. Right. Then Robin, Robin Williams did a bit on that. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Catholic no, no snake handling necessary, right. <laughs> We've got all the vestments, all the costumes, and uh, and even the incense burners, to which the phrase is, honey, I love your dress, but your purse is on fire. <laughs> I, I enjoyed one, – one thing that struck me about the Pasadena place, uh, All Saints, was I got the feeling – and this is – I believe it was my first time – might not have been. I might have gone, gone to an Episcopal church with my grandma when I was younger or something because she took me to Lutheran and a few other places. Um, I ended up getting baptized in a Lutheran church when I was 10. Uh, but anyhow – um, this last time I went, it was like a castle. It was sort of, I mean, it was obviously made more recently than the castles, but it was like in the style of a medieval castle. And there were banners hung that were reminiscent of medieval times. The, oh, the, yeah. the hymns themselves were reminiscent of like Renaissance fair. So it, it struck me as like, like I mentioned earlier, the Tridentines and I, you know, I have nothing against them. I just had that one impression of, from the priest, but I mean, they, they take, take themselves very, very seriously what they're doing, but you can't really take yourself that seriously when you so resemble 
<laughs> you know, oh King goodness. Arthur. <laughs> you know, oh, when, which I think I is well, a I'm, great thing. I, oh, I think so too. I've always said that our best our best selling point as Anglicans is we're the church for the Ren, the Ren Fair people. Right. Yeah. You know, if you if, if you've got if you're an English major, you know, or a psych major, this is the place for you. I mean, if you, you majored in poetry, this is the. Church I had for that you. feeling that I was surrounded by the nerds and the Tolkien fans, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh. Yes. Oh, we, 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 I think Comic we almost Con. canonized. Yeah. yeah, Saint Tolkien. We did. We did canonize C.S. Lewis. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I think. I think we're working on Tolkien next. Um, There's a few um, saints from the East that the Roman Catholic Church has gotten rid of. For example, Saint George, uh, that the, uh, that the Anglicans still have around. Does he make an appearance in the Episcopal Church? Actually, Saint George is still one of the bona fides. Oh, good. Uh, I, I, oh, I know you mean in Roman? I know this. I mean Roman, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, Roman as, as well as I, they couldn't because so many countries right. still uphold Saint George as their patron saint, right. even though you might have some some mists of history that Saint George is lost to. Yeah, and um, for those who don't know what we're talking about, he's the one who slayed a dragon to save a princess, and then they threw Jesus in there just for good measure to make it not so obviously pagan. And so, not the pagan, right. right? And so, more recently, there's been a few people who said we should in the Roman Church that have said we should get get rid of Saint George. He's obviously not part of Christianity, but I mean, he's a rich part of. British history. Every every night that's ever been knighted was knighted in the name of Saint Michael, and yes. Saint George. Yes, yes. Hey, you know that you know that ceremony. Speaking of that, they do the dubbing with right. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed how the sword goes from shoulder to shoulder and back to the other shoulder? Do you know why? Why is that? To make them headless. Oh, nice. <laughs> the headless warriors. <laughs> The headless warrior. It, it is one of those great, wonderful pagan practices mm. of to lose your head and to still keep it, or to be one of the headless ones. Right. Uh, is, is is the seat of. Uh, it, it, it's a very primal part for us as humans, anyway, and, and obviously the most vulnerable part of our body. Right. Uh, before before an animal dies, if it really, in the wild, when the an, when two animals are fighting, when one knows it's completely lost, it 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 has a moment where it deliberately exposes its jugular as if to say kill me quickly so it it, it is very primally the, the the most vulnerable place but uh, the ritual itself is meant to indicate uh, having given one's head to the sovereign mm. uh, and and also to be one of the the the, no, the noble people or one of the knighted people who has uh, survived with and without their head simultaneously hmm so your body is empowered to act in the name of the crown, and yes. you're no longer able to make decisions on your own, within your own head. <laughs> your head is not your own. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Well, uh, <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble if I talk about the sovereign without a head. Um, no, I think uh, there's a Nikkei it, statue that reminds me of. Wasn't that the origin of wings on angels? Oh, I don't know that. Oh I yeah, there was. Uh, I, I I might not. That might not be a hundred percent. I think Todd told me that one. Um, that uh, it was like second century artists that were looking at this old pagan statue and thinking, oh, that'd be a nice way to depict how angels can move quickly from one place to another is just give them these big old ah, wings yeah. that mo yeah. modeled after the winged victory. Yeah, yeah, we are. There, yeah. There's, there's nothing taken about angels with wings. <laughs> It's interesting how these things evolve, though. I, I mean, from a union perspective, of course, probably there aren't that many ardent atheists listening to this podcast. Um, but I mean, there, there's definitely some fans of Jung uh, yeah. so that can that can appreciate the evolution of our symbols and you know that kind of thing. I uh, the other the other interesting thing about I mean, clearly the the Episcopal Church, like in some ways the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox carries all of that heavy symbolism, uh, trying to both use the Jungian archetypes uh, as well as all of the, the, the various accretions, both both Christian and, and, and pagan and cultural, um, you know, Christmas trees and whatnot mm -hmm. that have, have made their way in and Easter eggs. Um, but I was sitting with, I was at an ordination of a friend years ago, and every every priest is in their finery, uh, sort of robed and doing the formal procession in and sitting and laying on of hands. 
and the bishop and the mitre, etc. And one of the uh, priest's professor friends was a uh, a, a, a Buddhist nun, mm-hmm. and she's there in her brown robes and and uh, and shaven head. And we're we're chatting. She ha- happens to be in the procession with me, as you can only do in an Episcopal ordination, and. Uh, we're sitting side by side and I forget the moment of the Eucharist, the moment of the consecration when there was incense and movements and gestures. And I leaned across and I said, welcome to Mahayana Christianity. (laughs) (laughs) It's a high level joke that that only, only if you can get, but it it really is, you know, there's at its, at its best, I think that's, that's sort of the, the description for what, uh, what what church can be yeah uh, in terms of it it's all about the form and it's not about the form well and it's an interesting point about buddhism how yeah, a lot of people have made the, the the point that buddhism isn't a religion but when you look at people waving incense and chanting and showing up on mm-hmm. time you know every sunday and getting a blessing and putting their prayer in a fire and all this kind of stuff it looks a lot like a religion um right but yeah at its core of um, at the core of one you have the credo you have something that starts with we believe in and then yeah. and then at the core of the other you have well you have you know life is suffering the noble truths the eightfold path mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. this kind of thing mm-hmm. which which seems more like it could be a discipline or or mm-hmm. uh, or a school of thought uh but yeah but yeah those things those things we all kind of <laughs> share in common and, and in a way that, that maybe that's the cultural elements that you know in every tribe everywhere there was a totem and there was incense and there was people going around in circles and revering ancestors and and especially the the saints especially the ones that they liked a lot that did great things and uh and so in order for something to come in and get all of those people on the same page they have to kind of give some concessions here and some concessions there i can't imagine that buddha himself or siddhartha Gautama would have approved of statues of him (laughs) or you know some of the other practices that were done in his name but i think jesus would kind of be aghast to see uh, himself being crucified everywhere (laughs) (laughs) guys really We're like, sorry, violent cells, dude. It was that or sex. No. <laughs> Does that? I'm not really that heavy, am I? <laughs> um, have you heard the uh, the the Christian version of the uh, of the Buddhist uh, three refuges? Uh, 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 I take refuge in the Christ. I take refuge in the Gospels. I take refuge in the communion of saints. Mm, <laughs> nice. A, 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 uh, for the Buddha, Dharma, and uh, Sangha. What, what's the, the Buddhist uh, the one? Pe- uh, the, the Tibetan Buddhist one is I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha, which is the way many of their texts begin, uh, meaning I uh, I seek protection or I seek my salvation, if, if to use Christian terms or Western terms. Uh, I take my refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It, it's repeated so often in, in some of the uh, Tibetan ceremonies yeah. particularly. And the Christian version of that would be the Christ, the the uh, the Dharma would be the Gospels, and the Sangha would be the Communion of Saints. Just to to create a Western overlay on an Eastern idea, there's a similar a strong similarity in the way that uh, the the Western Church will say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that the sense that saying in the name of or to um, uh, to to commit some to, to commit to someone uh, in their name was to take refuge in them or to seek salvation in them. Mm. So by saying in the name of is not unlike an Eastern idea of seeking refuge or seeking uh, safety or seeking uh, salvation or or seeking to be adopted by. Um, so there's some interesting crossovers about how. Uh, Buddhism, uh, some of the Buddhist phrases begin and how some of the Christian phrases begin as well. I've heard that it was uh, Greek statue makers that made some of the first Buddha statues uh, after oh, af- really? after Alexander had taken over Western India. Ah, uh, yes. Nothing like the Greek statue makers. There was the, uh, the in, you know, certain kinds of breath work, for example, uh, in the Easter, and I believe these are Sanskrit words, Sut and Nam, um, uh, sat being being truth and nam being identity. So you inhale truth and exhale identity. Mm-hmm. 
you know, making mm. a breath uh, whisper. And I've heard that in certain Greek Orthodox uh, practices, they do a similar breath work where they inhale Kyrie and exhale eleison, inhaling Ooh. Lord and exhaling have mm. mercy, mm. which of course is a shortened version of Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner, and keep me on right. the pathway of truth. Right. All right. Um, it, it's that that whole breathwork piece, which uh, is a little more than conjecture. To to look at the uh, the original name of God in the in the Tetragrammaton mm-hmm. is all breath um, is is said to be the, the the breathing in and the breathing out. Lord, you give us your name, and we uh, we come to life. You withdraw it, and and we die. Mm. Um, that the the thing about the Yahweh is that it is all vowels. It is all breath, and um, it's thought that it could even have been an early form of the chant that was done by the people around the ark. Uh, so you talk about this very ancient idea of, of finding finding phrases to breathe in and breathe out, and it's it's not unlikely that Yahweh was a, a phrase that was not only meditated on by the Kabbalists, but it was also a name that may have actually been chanted or shouted uh say as the ark is 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 entering or leaving the the tabernacle mm. um so a couple of one you, you start looking at the psalms and and some of the uh the songs of isaiah uh, blessed are those who know the festal shout cry aloud inhabitants of zion ring out your joy for the great one in the midst of you is the holy one of israel so in the midst of actually proclaiming uh, uh, shouting for joy the holy one is there it's also said uh the uh start looking at the psalms uh the uh the uh, the lord is enthroned upon the praises of israel the idea that that if the whole community is is chanting, singing, and shouting, uh, they could actually have been chanting Yahweh, Yahweh, or some version, some variant of that uh, vowel, vowelistic expression for the for the name of God. Mm. Which, of course, would be you know, after after the fall of the first temple or. Um, after degrading times, say, hey, let's not give this name to the whole people. Let's just give this to the to the priest once a year to utter um, in 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 his own joy uh, in the midst of the tabernacle. Um, but somehow the the experience of a community, and this is one one of the things I've discovered in just working with large groups of, of worshipers, is uh, when we're all singing together and it's we're able to forget ourselves just long enough to sense the holy in our midst that's that's when although anglicans often sing just the stuffiest hymns. <laughs> um, yeah ellen watts had a lot to say about <laughs> his, his upbringing <laughs> in saint paul's cathedral yeah <laughs> yeah just just imagine that you've got a, a high wing edwardian collar on while you're singing anything from that hymnal <laughs> and uh, you'll, you'll be able to echo it just fine yeah oh eddie izzard had a good one about that too about Having more. Oh yeah. <laughs> having enough fame and wealth and power to make Solomon blush, and up there singing blush. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Jeezy, crazy. What is that sound? <laughs> I actually preached uh, some Eddie Izzard one of my first years here at this church. I was uh, happened to have a uh, an Englishman in, in the congregation that day who, was, who said, oh, Eddie Izzard? <laughs> I didn't think anyone here knew who he was. And I, I preached on the uh, the difference between the Roman Catholic Confession and the Anglican Confession, which was, uh, you know, go to a Roman Catholic confessional and say, bless me, Father, for I'm a terrible sinner. And yes, you are, says the priest. Go away, and there'll be seven Hail Marys and poke you in the eye with a badger with a spoon or something. And, and the Anglican priest says, you say, I, bless me, Father, I'm a terrible sinner. And the Anglican priest says, well, so am I. <laughs> That'll be two Bloody Marys, and you won't remember a thing. You couldn't have had the Spanish Inquisition and the Church of <laughs> <laughs> But it hurts. Oh, loosen it up a bit. <laughs> loosen it up a bit. Tea, tea and cake or death. Tea and cake or death. Well, we're out of cake. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky we're Church of England. <laughs> well, let's see. Yeah, I, I think. Oh, sorry. Go I on. think that's the. Cha- I said that's that's really the challenge, though, and I think it's 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 the challenge of any 
any ritualized worship, any any time we do something by rote, is how to keep it fresh. Yeah, and and how to make it authentic and relevant, and uh, and actually be a window, a true icon for for holiness, right. uh, or an icon to revelation. I mean. Uh, Every everyone who listens to the Esoteric Nerd podcast is, I, I imagine, is hoping to kind of pierce through the veil themselves. And, yeah. And in in whatever ritualized way we do it, or whatever you know, rote way we do it. I mean, it, it takes practice and it takes work, but it also takes some kind of trusting in the work that's been done up to a certain point, um, so that you can just ride on top of it. Yeah. And remaining in present time. And be experiencing oh, yeah. it as if it were for the first time, not only as a mental trick, but actually being in that place where Keter is unfolding in the Tree of Life through Malkut in present time, being aware right. that right, right, right. that's really the only thing there is, is that Zim Zum that is ongoing. Right, 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 right. Um, quick, quick shout out. I, um, I, I Hello to... Uh, some dear friends I have not seen uh, face to face or, or voice to voice in a long, long time. Uh, keeping y'all very much in prayer and uh, keep the faith, keep working hard, and uh, do the work. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's all uh, it's all real, and uh, this is the most uh, part of the most real part of it. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for for doing this podcast and and keeping keeping the world connected in this way, uh, especially of the uh, those of us of the island of misfit toys <laughs> who are uh, uh, re really uh, sort of trying to to paddle our way through the great ocean of. Uh, the numinous all around us. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I have a feeling there might be one or two people out there, maybe with a tattoo of a pentagram here and there, or maybe even a unicursal hexagram, who might be raising an eyebrow considering a career as a rector in the Episcopal Church for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and some may have a, a, a Celtic cross with uh, the all-seeing eye somewhere in the midst. Uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, we, this is, uh, as I say, we, the Episcopal Church uh, welcomes all, which is a great gift, which is a great, great gift. Yeah, that is great. Yeah, there isn't that debate about, you know, letting women be priests. It's it's all it's all established. It's all the doors are wide open. All the precedents have been fought for. And my mom, yeah. even when she was 15, she wanted to be an Episcopal priest. But at the time, they weren't allowing women priests. And so she just kind of gave up and went a different direction. Well, the uh, I'll, as a privileged white male, I will have to say, uh, along with Ed Bacon, you know, we won the civil rights movement, but the the fight for racism is far from over. Yeah. Uh, we we have won the right for women to be priests, uh, equal pay and 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 rights for for women. My my sister, women priests, uh, is still is still much work to be done. Right. Much much work to be done. Yeah. Um, but the doors the doors are much more open than they ever have been and uh and we're <laughs> as as my father said when I became episcopalian he said well son at least you've joined the one church that can always be shamed into doing the right thing <laughs> And, at which I took great offense, and then I kind of relaxed and said, well, hey, I, yeah, sure, I'll go with that. That's about, about true. Look at the history. Look at the history. Yeah. yeah, I think Martin Luther was the only one to pull that off with the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just that and, one yeah. time, too. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and even then he couldn't get it to, to get shamed into the right thing for at least about 100 years later, and, and even then it was uh, – a little, too little too late for the uh, folks in Germany. Yeah. Well, I do like this guy, Francesco. He seems all right. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we actually have a game at, at our house. It's called Vatican. And it, <laughs> it's like the game of life. You can choose the career path or you can choose the uh, the church path. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's it, in the game Vatican, it, it really mimics the way you become pope. And my kids and I have played this game, and there's uh, when when Francis was elected uh, Bishop of Rome and, and and Pope of the Universal uh, Church Catholic out of Rome, the uh, Silvia Pajoli on NPR had nothing on him. She couldn't. All she could say was he was a Jesuit. Hmm. And my son was in the car with me listening to NPR, and and he said, Dad, 
what's a Jesuit? I said, son, he's the one that starts with negative 20 in the game of Vatican on the road to becoming Pope. <laughs> I said, so automatically, I think we're going to like this guy. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, I, I, Athanasius Kircher was a Jesuit. The, uh, yes. the guy who famously yes. put together the tree of life, which is used in, uh, modern hermeticism. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, a lot of the Rosicrucian texts, um, I'm going to forget the century, but they also likewise, uh, if the Jesuits were called the Society of Jesus, some of the, uh, the Ro there are some wonderful series of Rosicrucian woodcuts that r were said to have emerged from the true society of Jesus. Interesting. Uh, you know, there, there was already an attempt at lineage and then just add an incorporated or... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the authentic. <laughs> the authentic. The authentic true society of Jesus. The reformed <laughs> true society of Jesus. Um, but uh, so, I, I, yeah, the, the, uh, the Jesuits had quite an influence even on the, the Rosicrucians by saying that they were the Society of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and, and, but and in similar style, some of the Rosicrucian uh, meditations were not unlike some of the, uh, the meditations of Ignatius uh, Loyola to, to, to imagine oneself at the foot of the cross or to imagine oneself uh, participating in uh, carrying the cross for Jesus hmm. uh, with Simon of Cyrene. So there, there were uh, sort of a, there's the same meditational movement that was part of the foment of the Jesuits uh, had al also a great influence on some of the esoteric societies yeah. that, that came out of that time as well. Yeah, I think they were definitely parallel and if not a little bit of overlap and weaving back and forth from what we from what we do know about, you know, Trithemius, for instance, being the, the one who built up the Benedictine order to the where to the point where we've heard of it. And then, uh, you know, on the other hand, being the father of, uh, you know, Western esotericism in some sense, the teacher of Agrippa, friends with Robert Flood and so on. Yes. Yes. Is there a, an Episcopal blessing for the masses that you would like to uh, close with? May the peace of the risen Christ, who rises with healing in his wings, stretch forth to heal all who participate and hear in this podcast. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Blessings on this second day of Christmas out of the 12 days. Thank you. Uh, you it, too. It, I hope you have a great 12th night. And uh, if we don't speak before then, uh, plenty of carnival and wassail, and, uh, which is just a great way of saying party, partying and drinking. Right? <laughs> nice, nice. You too. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Blessings. And uh, peace to all. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Very honored frater A.K.H.V. for joining us on the Esoterra Nerd Podcast tonight. I mentioned during the interview that Alan Watts at one point was an Episcopal priest. Some of your ears might have perked up recalling hours of listening to Alan Watts lectures. However, if you don't know who I'm referring to, I suggest searching on your favorite podcasting platform for Alan Watts. Someone has put together a podcast out there. I don't know that they've procured the permission of the people who own the recordings, uh, which is why I will play less than 30 seconds of a clip for you to give you a sample of who this is uh, that we're talking about here. But I do recommend searching for that podcast, subscribing to it, starting with its episode one, and listening to it during your commute, if you're not familiar with it. Every one of us is a whirlpool in the tide of existence and we are in every cell in our body every molecule every atom is in constant flux and nothing can be pinned down and so i'll close with a traditional white anglo-saxon protestant greeting for this time of year we wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.